as I put this message together, I, I don't know that I've been more aggravated in putting a message together than this one today. And I think that I've fought through the years over the many families that I have seen crash and burn and, and leave the church. And I don't mean our church, I just mean leave the church. Uh, to feel like that they have been tossed to the side and, and given, up, given away or, or their life is over. Uh, to where the church is coming to today where uh, now the trending is that church is completely irrelevant. Which is what the devil would ultimately want. That's what he wants is for you to throw the towel in and give up on everything. And as I have looked at what I'm, I'm dealing with today, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really challenged by how we got it wrong. So I want you to, to consider a thought. Whenever two people are placed in front of the same exact subject matter in the same exact context and yet two people come up with two different outcomes or two different outlooks or two different opinions. Why is that? And I think that the reason is it, it's determined by what set of values or principles we choose to live by or accept as truth. So if you have different values, you have different outlooks, you have different outcomes. It's always going to be that way. And one of the challenges of the family of God is that we're supposed to actually come to the same conclusions as God does because we all choose to follow the same word and the same God. So we should come to the same conclusion, but we don't. And the reason that we don't is we have yet to really grab a hold of what God says. I want to give you an example. I want you to consider this morning for just a moment that a new family has arrived at our church, okay? And I want you to decide what you would do with this family. And what would you tell me to do with this family? I saw them pile out of a van this morning. This is a hypothetical family. But they piled out of a very large 15-passenger bus this morning. Okay? There was one dad in the bus. And he, came, he was driving. And he got out. And as I saw them come in, I wanted to meet them. And so I said, who are these folks with you? And he said, well, this is my wife. And I said, well, good to meet you. And he said, and this is my wife. I said, okay, good to meet you. Like, is, is this your first wife? Is this your second wife? He says, no, 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 this, this is my wife, and this is my wife. I like, okay. And uh, I said, well, who are these other two ladies? Well, this is the mother of these kids, and this is the mother of these kids. Who's the father? Well, I'm the father. Of, this is the mother of these kids. This is the mother of these kids. These two are my wives. This is the mother of these kids. This is the mother of these kids. And I, I fathered those children with them. Got 13 kids, 12 boys, one girl. And uh, we were wondering if there's a place for us here at Northside. What would you do? That's a good question, isn't it? That, that's, that's too powerful for the congregation, and so we need to ask the pastor, or we need to ask the deacons. Uh, we need to ask maybe the congregation needs to vote on something, or we probably need the ever-valuable public opinion poll to find out what the public would think because the public is directing everything, including the Church of Christ today. We're much more concerned about what the world thinks than we are what God said and so that's one of the challenges that we face. Not only is that, that's a difficult question for the church, but it's a chosen question from God. And I want you to realize today that the family that I want to talk about today is the family of Israel, who is a man whose name used to be Jacob. He had two wives who were sisters, Leah and Rachel. There were four baby mamas, Leah Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah, 13 kids, 13 kids. So we had Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah. And then we had Dan and Asher, and then we had Naphtali. Then we had kind of some other ones, Issachar, Zebulon, Dinah. And then we had Joseph, and then we had Benjamin. And they all came from different baby mamas, same daddy. 
And this is God's chosen family. Now we're talking about a God who, Isaiah says, knew the end from the beginning, knew what was going to happen before he ever even started. He did that. And he chose this. That's what he chose. I told you last week that God, or week before last, that God has chosen the family as his foundational institution for everything that he does in this world, every single thing that he does. And the goal of the family is to make sure that we perpetuate the life of God and the message of God from generation to generation to generation until Jesus comes back. And I want you to consider this generation to generation to generation type situation because sometimes I think we forget about that and what that ultimately means and what God is actually doing in our midst. And so if we were to ask the question, what would God do? Uh, we don't have to speculate on what God would do because he wrote it. All you have to do is be able to read. You don't have to be able to speculate. What would God do? And I think that what I want to do this morning in 1 Corinthians, I want you to look in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. And here's what I want you to think about. I want you to give consideration to who these Corinthians are because they're going to answer this question for us. The city of Corinth is a, is a seafaring city. And it, in, the, in the scriptures, there is not a more wicked, sinful, fleshly, carnal, incestuous, sexual church than the church at Corinth. I mean, it's, it's in bad shape. The people of Corinth, before they met Jesus, just lived in the, in the normal day-to-day -day of what their society was, and their society was extremely sexual. They had the Acre Corinth, which was a place of worship, and the way that they worshiped, they worshiped the gods, and it was orgiastic worship, and so you just went up there and you had sex to commune with the gods. And so there was the potential for you to engage in sexual activity with your mom, your dad, your brother, your sisters, your nephews, your nieces, your brothers, and, and everybody all at one time in these dark places and stuff like that. And so can you imagine living that way and marriage and divorce and marriage and divorce and marriage and divorce was just something that was very rampant? And can you imagine after you've been married or divorced 50 times and you've had sex 150,000 times and, then, and you're just living that way and all of a sudden the gospel fall, finds its way on your footsteps, on your doorsteps, and you learn that you can be redeemed. And then when you receive this great gospel message and you start hearing the tenets of the gospel and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I think we have some questions. I'm not sure because I was reading the gospel of Matthew that said, hey, it's not right for a man to divorce his wife, but if any of he does and they do it for any other reason other than sexual immorality, then I've created the, uh, adultery and all kinds of stuff that's going on. And so there's these challenges that are there. And we need some answers. And so they asked Paul for some answers. In the New Testament, when the New Testament opens up, it opens up with family. In Matthew chapter 1, it opens up with the lineage of Jesus Christ. And in that lineage of Jesus Christ, it's an interesting thing to find the people that are in Jesus' lineage. A person like Rahab, who was a prostitute. A person like Tamar, who not only uh, had a couple of failed marriages, but also kind of messed with her father-in-law and ended up getting her father and her stepfather, basically, to uh, sleep with her and, and bear children uh, through her from her stepfather to bear a couple of kids. And all these people find themselves in the lineage of Jesus Christ and there are others, David, who was an adulterer and a murderer and, and so forth. And so these things are, are, are quite challenging to me to think about how God would choose this situation going on. How could he even do that? And what are the hopes for the families today that we have within our church that are coming in for the first time, or maybe you've been here for a long time, what hope do these families really have? Isaiah said that God's ways are not my ways and his thoughts are not my thoughts. His, high, his thoughts are higher and his ways are higher than mine. And I would absolutely affirm what Isaiah said. Our limited religious imaginations do not us, allow us to really understand how this could be. But not only could it be, it was and it is. It's what God chose to do. The Corinthians knew that they had no hope apart from Jesus. I'm not sure that we're still reminded of that. So I want you to look in your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want to read the 18th verse, and then I want to read verses 25 and, and, and beyond. I'll put it on the screen for you, but I really want you to capture the essence of what Paul is saying to these Corinthians who are having this huge question of how in the world is it possible that we Corinthians, whom you know who we are, and you know what we've done, 
and you know where our life sits. How can you say that we could do any of these things? And here's what Paul wrote in verse 18 of chapter one. He said this, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. If I could spend any time on that subject matter of being saved rather than I am saved, I could probably change your life. But I want you to understand something. You are always being saved. You've not arrived at anything. Some of you haven't even got started good. God is still saving you. He is still in the process. That doesn't mean you can lose your salvation. It means that your salvation is not a one-time act. It's an ongoing process until the day that he brings you home. And he says, to those of us who are being saved, there's something that we've learned, and that is that the cross of Christ is the power of God. How is it the power of God? How is it? He goes on to say in verse 25, he says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren. So I'm talking to all of you now. God's called every one of us, and if you don't believe that, you need to go back and see what the word church is translated from. It's translated from the word ekklesia, ek meaning out from, kaleo meaning to call. So every one of you have been called out from. That's the actual name of the church. So you are all called. And here's what he says. Notice your calling. Notice your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble. Noble means those who have an upright life and those who are doing just fine. He says, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things that are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? That no flesh would glory in his presence. The reason that God has done that is because there is such a capacity in man to somehow believe that there is anything in us that is praiseworthy. And in the face of God, I'm telling you, there is not one single one of us that have anything to offer to God that adds any single thing to God. God will receive all the glory. For, don't, don't you forget this. There is none righteous, no, not one. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. And so God says, I want you to understand something. What I choose doesn't make a lot of sense for some of you. What I choose to do blows the mind of the wisdom of the world. It blows away every thought that somebody else has as to what God himself would do. And when we look at family, family is something that God has chosen, which may not make any sense to you, but it's one of the things that God chose as his main foundation for everything in the world. Therefore, the devil is always after it. He does everything that he can to undermine and destroy the family itself. And yet God says... I want you to know, regardless of whether that family is what I ever intended it to be or not, it can still do what it was supposed to do. And in the face of the devil, I'm going to poke my eye and put my finger in his eye and let him know that regardless of what he does to these families, he cannot strip them from my hand. And this demonstrates the prerogative of God as to what he chooses to do in this world. But in order for them to do this, how, how is this really the, the power of God? I want, I want to explain it to you so that you understand. Uh, there's a, one of our singers today, we're standing right over here, Brian Gottry. Uh, he works for Toyota. So he sells cars. Because you imagine today if I sent you over to Hendrick Toyota and I says, oh, there's several of you in here this morning. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, and you can do this on, on my word, okay? I want you to just go over to Hendrick Toyota, just grab one of those cars off the lot, and just drive away. It's yours. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? The only problem is the police will be coming to get you a little later on because that would be stealing if you did that. Even if I told you you could do that, that would be stealing. What if I told you, though, that, hey, I, I had the privilege of leading Jeff Bezos to the Lord the other day. And I, if you don't know who he is, he, he kind of runs Amazon. He's the richest man in the world. And, and uh, after leading him to Jesus, that's not true. I wish it was. But after leading him to Jesus, he said, Kenny, I, I want to give you a little stipend over here. And he gave me a lot of money. Not a little bit of money, a lot of money. A whole lot of money. It was in the B's, not the M's, you know, in the, in the billions kind of a thing. And here's what I've done. I went over to Hendrick Toyota, and I cut him a check for every single car on the lot. Go get you one. Pick out whichever one that you want and carry it home. It's yours. 
Okay, you see, that would be different. And the reason it would be different is because I paid for it. That's what makes it different. I paid for it. When God asks you to do something, he doesn't ask you because he simply wants you to do it. He asks you because he paid for it. And that is what makes the cross the power of God to do anything that he wants to do on this planet and anything that he wants to do with you because he paid for it. The devil wants to convince you that he has not. Jesus said, I realize this sounds real foolish to those of you who don't understand, but for those of us who were saved, I'm telling you, this is what God has chosen to do. Well, you say, Pastor, wouldn't God prefer to use people that don't have such challenges in their life? Maybe so, I don't know, but here's what I know about people that don't have challenges in their life. When God invited the people that didn't have challenges, they didn't have time for God. Hey, tell them I've created this huge wedding feast. This is a benefit, a bonus. You're going to get a free meal, and we're going to have a great celebration, and I, I'm, the, I'm the king. I'm inviting you. Come on. What they say? Well, I ain't got time for that. I just got married. I ain't got time for that. I've just bought some land. I ain't got no time for that. I, I ain't got no time for that. <laughs> Sweet brown. <laughs> some of you know who I'm talking about, right? She had bronchitis. <laughs> And somebody says, you know, I went out and purchased some, some oxen, and I don't have time for that. You know what God said? God was angry. He told his servants, you better go out into the highways, the byways, and the hedges. You find the poor, the maimed, the blind, the deformed, and you bring them in so that my house can be full. See, somehow we believe that God is looking for righteous people. God's not looking for righteous people. God's looking for people. He doesn't care where you came from. He's redeemed them. It doesn't matter where you've come from, what you've done, how bad you are. God has redeemed you, and he wants to use you, and he wants to use the family. Unfortunately, like the Corinthians, some of our families have undergone some great challenge, and we've messed up a little bit. Now God says, well, what does that mean? I still have a work to do from generation to generation to generation. In other words, there's a couple of things that I really want you to catch a hold of this morning. The first, it's not on the screen, but the first one is this. I want you to know that if you've messed up, if you had a failure in your life, that God's plan is bigger than your failure and longer than your life. And that part I don't think you understand. It's longer than your life. Whenever King David messed up, the Bible says that Jesus is one day going to sit on the throne of David. David died a long time ago, but God's plan for David is going to transpire sometime in the future. And so even though David could not see it, God had a plan that was longer than the life of David. And for some of us, we don't always understand that what God's plan for us is not just stuck in the moment. It's longer than that. And so his, his plan is bigger than your failures, and it's longer than your life. And number two, if that's true, and it is, then I want you to stop thinking about the past, and I want you to embrace the present, but I also want you to step into what is beyond your life. Because some of us are only living for while we are here, not recognizing that God has something for you to do long after you're gone. There is something that is beyond. And so I want you to think beyond that way. If God's plan is bigger than your life, bigger than your failures, longer than your life, then we ought to be living for the moment but looking way beyond so that we can help God fulfill the things that he wants to fulfill in us. Now today we're going to examine this family, this family of Israel. Remember Israel's name used to be Jacob. It got changed at Peniel whenever he wrestled with God. But he had a couple of wives and he had a couple of concubines. He had 13 children, 12 boys and one girl. And this is God's chosen family. God chose this. You cannot negate the fact that God chose it. I'd have never done it, but God chose it. And I think that he chose it so that we would understand that where we are at the moment does not dictate all that God wants to do in our life. So let me share three things with you. Number one, I want you to see that God does not choose you for your current condition, but for your future impact. God never chooses somebody for their current condition. We're sinners. We're all messed up. In fact, we're too young to even know what's going on. I'll never forget I, when I was in seminary, 
Man, that seems a long time ago now. But when I was in seminary, I had all these thoughts and ideas. And now what I know so many years after seminary and, and what I knew then, it's like I was such an idiot then. And you know what's really bad? I think I'm probably still an idiot right now. And as you get older and you get more wiser, you realize how much you don't know in any given moment. God does not choose you for a given moment. He chooses you for the future impact that you can truly have. And let me tell you how Jacob started out. Jacob started as a deceiver. The father of this family started as a deceiver. So you don't have to have a good beginning. You don't. God chose this guy from the very, and, and from the very beginning, before he was even born, he was messed up. We love to read the Psalms, right? The Psalms, David's talking. He says, man, before, before I was ever formed in my mother's womb, God knew me and all the numbers of my days he had already ordained for me. We think, ah, David, great guy. Jacob's like, yeah, God knew me before I was born too. And man, how did I mess this up? I want you to see from his very beginnings, he was a deceiver. And there's two high water marks in Jacob's life, in the life with him and his brother, because he was a twin, that, that really highlight this deceptive nature of who he was. Now, Jacob was the second born of these twins. And when Esau, who his brother was, was born first. And as he was being born, Jacob reached out and grabbed a hold of his heel. And so they gave him the name Jacob or the supplanter, the one who's always trying to steal something from somebody else. Well, he stole two things from his brother Esau. Number one, he stole his birthright. And the, and the, the birthright was that whoever, when the father died, that the person with the birthright got twice the portion. So he basically got more. Let me just read it to you. And we're going to Jump right past that real quickly. But I just want you to see that he, he stole it. And notice how he stole it. He stole it in a moment of vulnerability. In Genesis 25, it says this. Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. So he's got him in a moment of vulnerability. Esau said to Jacob, hey, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which means red. And Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. That's a high price for some food, isn't it? I thought that Ruth Chris was high, but <laughs> he said, look at me. I'm about to die. So what, what good is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and a stew of lentils. And he ate and drank, arose, and he went his way. And thus Esau despised his birthright. And so we can see that, that from the very beginning, even from his birth, he was a he was a deceiver. And then we see him working it out on his brother. And then all the way, let's wrap it up closer to the toward the later parts of his life, and we discover that he steals not only his birthright, but he also steals his father's blessing. And the father's blessing is a big, big deal. I'm telling you it is. It's a very powerful thing which he gave. And so he stole that as well. So here, here's kind of the story of what happened. Uh, when these two boys were born, the parents weren't really right on target, right? Mama loved Jacob. Daddy loved Esau. Dad, Esau was sort of the sports figure, and he loved the sports figure. Jacob was probably more the nerdy kid. And so uh, dad loved the sports figure. Mom loved the nerdy kid. And that's what ended up happening. But their love was greatly expressed. They said so. They loved each other more. And so there was always a fight between Rebecca and Isaac, who were the parents. And Rebecca always favored Jacob. Isaac always favored Esau. And so in the end, in order to steal this blessing, Isaac always loved the cooking of his son Esau, who was a hunter. And so his mama cooked up an idea Rebecca comes to Jacob and says, hey, I'll tell you what, why don't you cook up a stew for your daddy, the kind that he really likes, like your brother cooks, and then we'll sneak in and you'll get the blessings. Oh, he's going to know. My brother's really, really hairy. He's like, oh, don't worry. And so they wrapped up some stuff on his arms and put some stuff around his neck and put some deer pee on him or something so that he smelled like it. And he snuck in and he basically tricked him to get it. And now Esau is without a blessing. And so I've already lost out when my daddy dies. Now I've lost out in my future life. And so he's angry. Here's what he says in Genesis 27. He says this, when Esau heard the words of his father, because he heard him blessing his brother, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me also, oh, my father. And he said, your brother came with deceit, has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob the supplanter? For he has supplanted me these two times. He has taken away my birthright. Now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Well, who was Jacob? He's a narcissist. The only thing he cares about is himself. It's the only thing he cares about. 
He doesn't care who he hurts. He doesn't care what kind of loss there is in somebody else's life. The only thing he cares about is himself, and God chose him. That's hard to believe, but he did. Number two, I want you to know that God doesn't exclude you because of your crazy journey. Has anybody had a crazy journey? I don't think if you would have asked me and if I were to ask you about your life, if you'd have said whenever you were first getting ready to have that baby, oh, man, I can, I'm telling you, I can see the future of this dear sweet child. Uh, he or she's going to be married about three, four times. They're going to have uh, some really bad kids, and they're going to be needing money from us for the rest of our life, and, and, and they're going to hate us and cuss us and all that kind of stuff. We are so excited about them getting here. <laughs> I don't think any of us say that, but sometimes that's exactly what happens, isn't it? We have a crazy journey. Let's talk about this journey. And, and, and I'll tell you what, sometimes it takes the journey for us to have the experience that changes our heart. See, some of you won't take wisdom. You won't just listen to what God says. You're like, well, I got to figure this one out on my own. And so when you decide to take that crazy journey, that experience is going to get to you. But sometimes that's what it takes to turn us around. And so what does this look like? In Genesis 27, the Bible says this. After the, the blessing was stolen, it said that Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which the father had blessed him. And so Esau said this in his own heart. He said, the days of mourning of my father are in, at hand, but when they're over, I'm going to go kill my brother. I'm going to kill my brother. Now, I wonder where he got that from. He got that from his great, 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 great granddaddy, Adam, who had a couple of kids when Cain said, I'm killing my brother because I don't like what he did. And so this thing keeps passing down from generation to generation to generation. But it started out with a crazy, crazy journey. Let's, let's start with, we, we've already know that Jacob started out as a deceiver. But guess what? Mama started out as a manipulator. You do realize that, don't you? <clears throat> Whenever this whole thing started, Rebecca was the one that said, let's go in there and mess with your daddy Isaac. And let's see if we can get him to give you the blessing. And so when that happened, then Esau got mad. Esau said, I'm going to kill you. So mama says, here's what you need to do. Let me ship you away to your uncle Laban, and I'll get your daddy to believe you need to go there. So she goes to daddy and says, oh, how horrible it would be if our boy married from somebody that wasn't part of our family. Why don't we send him to uncle Laban? That way he can find a wife there, and he'll have a pure bloodline. Isaac said, dumb. He buys into it. He doesn't know what's going on. So get ready to send him away there. And she, she figures, she tells Jacob, it's not going to be long. It's not going to be long. We just got to let your brother Esau cool off for a little while. You'll probably be back two, three weeks. Don't worry about it. You bet 20 years before he came back. 20 years. So we got this manipulation going on for 20 years. This is the chosen family of God. Chose a deceiver to be a daddy, a manipulator to be a mama. And thirdly, or secondly, chose an uncle that was opportunistic. Laban was that deadbeat, lazy uncle who found out, I, you know what? I could use him because I got something over him that he wants. Laban was a deceiver. Doesn't, doesn't shock me whenever his sister was a manipulator and he's a deceiver. They're all coming from some bad stock out there. So Laban invites in Jacob. Jacob comes in, love at first sight. You know that a woman will mess up a man's head faster than anything I know. And he'll do just about anything. And so he sees Rachel and he's like, son, she fine. I want her. So he goes to Laban and says, hey, can I have her? And he says, no, you can't just have her. You're going to work for her. If you work for me for seven years, at the end of seven years, I'll give her to you. He says, hey, not a problem. And the Bible says he loved her so much that that seven years basically went by so fast. He didn't even recognize it was seven years, like seven minutes to him because love has a way of doing something to time, right? And so the time comes for him to marry Rachel. And guess what? They have the big wedding feast and all this stuff goes on. So apparently Rachel was involved in that wedding feast. But when the time came for them to go into the marriage chamber, uh, see, they got... They got Jacob good and drunk, and when he woke up the next morning, he saw a cross-sided woman looking at him. Happened to be Leah. Whoa! What in the world? That's where I think that's where they get that thing. Went to bed with a ten, woke up with a two. I think that's what happened. <laughs> two beady eyes looking at me. And so now he's like, whoa, 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 what have you done? What have you done? 
And he said, well, here's the deal. We are not in the business of giving away our older, our younger daughters before we give away our older daughters. And so you get her. He didn't want her. So now we've got a deceptive daddy, a manipulating mama, an opportunistic uncle, and this is the chosen family of God. Okay? Now we've got Jacob married to Leah, who he did not want. And he's like, well, I, 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 still, I still want Rachel, which probably made Leah feel pretty good. I still want Rachel. He said, we've got to work another seven years for her. So he's like, all right, I'll work another seven years. And so he works another seven years, and he finally marries Rachel. But as he marries Rachel, guess what? Uh, they've got now, I don't know if you've ever had two women in the same house. That don't work. It really doesn't. Um, so they're, they're at odds with it. And not only are they, they're sisters. And so they're battling back and forth. And now I know that this has probably never, ever, ever happened in a marriage before. But there are times in history and in the scriptures where a wife would use children to gain the affection of a husband without ever thinking about the kids that would be born. And so guess what? Now a, a baby birthing competition starts up. And so we have now two jealous wives. So you've got Leah who starts to have some babies, and who does she have? She starts off with the top four, with Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. We know that Jesus came from the, is the lion of the tribe of Judah, so he, his lineage comes from Leah, the one that wasn't even supposed to be his wife in the first place. Uh, Levi is the priestly tribe where all the priests come from. Aaron and Moses and those kind of people came from there. So we know that, that this was a, a good lineage that was going on, that God's chosen to use this lineage. But here's what happens. Leah gets pretty bold because she's sort of outdoing Rachel. Well, guess what? Rachel's mad. Rachel's like, nah, 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 it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I've got some other ways to do it. God's got me barren for whatever reason. That does not mean I can't do anything. Where do you think she got her ideas from? From Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. It's like, I know, I've got a handmaid. Her name is Bilhah. And I will give Bilhah to you if you have a baby and she will have a baby for me. And then that way, my husband, here's what they kept saying. My husband will love me more if I give him this child over here. So that's exactly what Rachel does. And so you've got now these innocent handmaids that through no fault of their own and no choice of their own get drug into this situation. They get drug in. So through Bilhah, we end up with Dan and Naphtali. And these two boys now, now Jacob has kind of moved over to Rachel because Rachel gave the handmaid. And, 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 and guess what that does to Leah? Now Leah is jealous. But Leah, for whatever reason, can't have any more kids right now. So what does she do? Well, I too can play that game. I, I got Zilpah. She's my handmaid. I can do whatever I want with her. And so you come in and you be with Zilpah and then two more kids are born from them. What in the world is going on? What's happening here? I mean, have you ever thought about that? What is going on with these people where we're playing with these kids' lives and, they, and they're having some, some real challenges? And so we see what happens. We, we get Gad and Asher that come from Zilpah. And so we've got now, had four, got four more, got eight kids. So guess what? Now that Jacob's kind of moved back over to Leah, Rachel's like, what in the world is going on? We got to do something better. But there's so much jealousy, and then God blesses Leah again. She has three more kids. Three more. She has Issachar, Zebulun, and Dinah, their only girl. So he sits down. Now Rachel's feeling real bad. So she's praying to God, and, and God finally blesses her. She ends up with Joseph. And when she gets Joseph, oh, then you find out the partiality that Jacob learned way back in his own home that it was okay to be partial with your kids. And he liked Joseph better than he liked any of his other kids because the person that he really loved was Rachel. And this is the firstborn of Rachel. And that's where the whole story of the coat of many colors and then we're going to kill our brother and throw him in the cistern and, and all that mess happens with Joseph. And in the process of having Joseph, though, we start to see now that Jacob is about tired of all this. He's getting worn out with his family. So, so let me see if I got this right. God chose a deceptive husband, a manipulating mom, a opportunistic husband, jealous wives that are the offspring, 
uh, to use some handmaids to make this happen, only then to finally bless the second wife who was intended to be the first who ended up being the second so that he could raise up the kid that would be the favorite that would be hated by all of the brothers and thrown into a cistern and carried away into Potiphar's house to have a good testimony and to lose his testimony, only to go to jail, only to get it back, to be the prince of Egypt to deliver people. Is this how God works? It's written down. It's written down that that's how he did it. And Jacob says, you know what? I'm, I've kind of had enough. So that last wife that he loved, Rachel, he has Joseph, but then she ultimately has Benjamin. Well, the Bible says, basically, this is deception and manipulation on steroids. How, how could God, how could he ever choose this? I'll tell you how. Through the power of the cross. When God looked into to the sea of humanity, guess what he saw? Sinners. Who am I going to use? Sinners. Uh, are you going to pick the good sinners or the bad sinners? He's just going to pick sinners. What do sinners do? Sin. And so he had to do something about the sin, which was Christ, which is the power of God to do the things that he wants to do. And it doesn't matter. But he's, he's also chosen a family to do this through. And sometimes our families get convoluted. But within this family is still a dad, and there's still a mom, and there's still children, and there's still the life of God, and there's still the message of God that's got to get passed down from generation to generation to generation. And God is still in the business of passing this stuff down. So Jacob finally says, I'm done. I need to go back. What does the journey going back look like? Listen to Genesis chapter 30. The Bible says this. It came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph. So now we're down to the 12th child. She has yet in birth, Benjamin yet. That Jacob said to Laban, Laban, hey, send me away. That I can go to my own place, to my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I've served you. And let me go. Because you know the service which I've given you. He couldn't just go. And Laban said, oh, I'm not going to let you go, man. I am not going to let you go. I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to let you go. God has blessed me because you're here. And so he says, well, okay, fine. And, and God had different plans. He wanted him to go back. So they had this whole issue of uh, livestock. And, and then they were going to separate some livestock up. And Laban got the speckled ones. And he got the ones without the speckles. And God didn't bless the speckled ones. And he blessed the Jacobs until Jacob got mad. And finally, uh, it found out the contention was so bad that Jacob said, we're out. We're, out. we're leaving. So they kind of take off and they, they go away. But here's the problem. Here's the problem with coming back. You can't just come back. Why'd you leave? Why did you leave? Why did he leave? He left because his brother Esau wanted to kill him because he had stolen his blessing and his birthright. You think you can just walk back in? And God says, no, 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 you can't just walk back in. There's some things you got to take care of. And so there's two things sitting there that need to happen with Jacob. He needs to deal with his brother Esau, but he also needs to deal with God. Because you see, the parts of the story I haven't covered, uh, there was a time when he was leaving, that he was kind of hanging out sleeping one night, and he had this vision of a ladder that went up to heaven. And he saw these angels ascending and descending on this ladder, and he called that place Bethel, the place of God. And in doing that, God said, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something great with you. But you know what? He paid no attention to it. Paid no attention to the calling of God. 20 years, he paid no attention to the calling of God. And so he had unfinished business with God. He had unfinished business with man. And he had to do something about it. God still wants to use him. And God is still using him. But he's got to take care of this unfinished business. And so here, thirdly, I want you to see, God is ready to use you when you are ready to be used again. It is not that you're like, well, I'm waiting on God. No, 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 no. God's waiting on you. You are never waiting on God. God is always waiting on you. He always is. And so guess what happens? He's had enough of Laban that he's on his way back. As he's going on the way back, he gets word. Your brother Esau's coming to meet you. And he's thinking, uh-oh, this is going to be it. And he had enough love for his family that he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Let me see if I can bribe him because he is still a manipulator. He's still deceitful. Let me send all kinds of stuff forward. Now, I'll, I'll make my brother wealthy. I stole his blessing. I stole his birthright. I'm going to pay it back. 
I'm going to pay it forward. So I'm going to send them all out there in front of me. And hopefully by the time, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the big man. I'm going to hang out right here at the back. Boy, he learned something in 20 years, hadn't he? Let me send my wife, my children, my servants, my money. Let me send all that forward. Now, I'll, I'll be behind y'all all the way. Don't worry. And so he's hanging out in the back. When he's all by himself, he has a meeting with God. Now watch what happens. In Genesis 32, it says this. He arose that night, took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 sons, crossed over to the fort at Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, sent them over with what he had. And then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of a joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go. The angel was saying, let me go for day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Man, I, I, I look forward to some of you getting to that place where you're wrestling with God and you let God know, no, 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 no. You can do whatever you want to do, but I'm not letting you go till you bless me. And he said, so he said to him, what's your name? And he said, it's Jacob. He said, that is not your name any longer, but Israel is going to be your name for, watch this, you have struggled with God and you have struggled with man, and you have overcome. You have overcome. So regardless of whatever happened, and guess what he cannot do? He cannot undo. He cannot undo Leah. He cannot undo Rachel. He cannot undo Bilhah. He cannot undo Zilpah. He cannot undo 13 kids. He cannot undo 20 years. He cannot undo anything. God didn't ask him to undo. He said, wrestle with that. Let's do something about that. So Jacob goes home, and obviously when he meets his brother, his brother said, I don't, I don't want all your stuff. He said, I'm just glad to have you back. Love your brother. Let's go on and live. And so he begins raising his 13 children, all of them, with Leah, with Rachel, with Zilpah, and with Bilhah, and he raises all 13 of those kids. Now, did he ever have some trouble? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Did they ever have trouble and trouble with the kids? But guess what? Joseph which was the second youngest to Rachel, who was his favored wife, who was literally going to be the son of promise. He raised him up, and ultimately he became the prince of Egypt, the savior of the land during that seven-year famine. And jo I don't know that Joseph had any thought in his mind when he was leaving that God needed a Joseph. God's plan for Jacob was beyond Jacob's life. It was for Joseph. It was for Joseph. Had Jacob thrown the towel in because, oh, I've messed up. God's like, you may, everybody's messed up. I'm using your mess to get to somewhere that I need to get to. Which is why when we look into Matthew chapter 1 and we start to look at the lineage of Jesus Christ, we begin to recognize that in that line there's a whole bunch of mess-ups all the way through until we get to Jesus Christ who's the Redeemer. And the devil is trying to tell the church today that every time a family messes up, they're no longer usable. That is wrong. I'm here to tell you that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound those of us who seem to be wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to overcome those of us who seem to be strong so that there will be no boasting whenever God is here. And here's Jacob. I mean, here's Joseph in Genesis chapter 50 in the latter parts. He says this. He says to my brothers, because his brothers are like, oh, we're, we're afraid now that daddy died. So, so daddy is now dead. He says, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm concerned. Jacob or Israel, our father, has died. And now because of all that bad that we did to Joseph, we know that he's going to destroy us because of the place that he's in. And he's really in charge now. And Joseph, Joseph says, hey, man, hey, guys, am I in the place of God? Don't worry. Am I in the place of God? He said, though you meant it for harm, God meant it for good. So it be as it is to this day that we have saved many people alive. And there's some of us today that have tossed the towel in because we look at our families and we're like, well, we're going to come to this church, but we're going to sit on the back row and we're never going to do anything because if they knew what was going on in our life, they would never want to have any part of us. I'm here to tell you this that many of the righteous families won't serve God anymore. 
Many of the righteous families have gotten upset that some unrighteous families might serve God only because the righteous families don't understand they're unrighteous. And God says, if, 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 you know what God said? If, if, the, if the people won't worship me, I get the rocks to do it. The rocks will cry out if I have to. Uh, God can't use, did God use Pharaoh? Pharaoh was lost, pagan, and hated God. God used him. God used Cyrus. God used Darius. Did God use Nebuchadnezzar? Did God use Pontius Pilate? Yes, God used all. You don't think that if God could use those people that God can use you? Don't you dare let somebody steal from you what your heritage in God is. We've come today where the family, the family unit is falling apart, and especially in the church, and the families aren't serving God in the church because we've had a bump in the road. Hey, welcome to the club. Here's what I know. God's plan is bigger than my failures. David murdered Uriah the Hittite, slept with Bathsheba, and God still used him. He didn't elevate or say that it was a good thing, and I'm not either. I'm just saying it wasn't a disqualifying thing. He still needed help to go out there. Moses was a murderer. God still used him. Moses was a coward. God still used him. Gideon was a coward. God still used him. The apostle Paul was a persecutor of God's church. He turned him and used him. The apostle Peter was a narcissistic guy. God still used him. Your pastor was a pagan, a God mocker. And God still uses. He still uses what excuse do we have? How would you think about this today? To those Corinthians who said, oh my goodness, I've been married 55 times. Can God use me? Yes. Yes. Does God want me exalting my 55 marriages? No. I've stolen things. I'm a larcenous. Can God use me? Yes. Does God want to honor your theft? No. I've had 13 abortions. Can God use me? Yes. Does he want you to hold up high your abortions? No. No. King David was one of the greater sinners in the Bible because he knew more. And in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, God says this of King David. He served his generation and then he died. He did not say, oh, he slept with that woman Bathsheba. He was lusting at her on the roof. Had a baby with her. Killed him, Uriah the Hittite. He didn't say that. He said, King David served his generation and then he died. That's called grace. God wasn't kidding when he said, if you receive Jesus Christ, I will remember your sins no more. And where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Stop offering for your sin and start serving your God. Why? Because God's plan for you is bigger than the failures in your life and is longer than your life. I wonder how many of you God is using to produce a Joseph in another generation that you're never going to meet until heaven. When, we read, when you read the New Testament, when you read the book of Revelation, or you read Thessalonians, or you read Daniel, or you read Ezekiel, all the prophetic literature, there's a lot of stuff haven't been fulfilled yet. You know what none of you are thinking? None of you are thinking that's going to be part of our offspring, but where are they coming from? Where are the two prophets coming from? Where are the next evangelists coming from? Where are they coming from? Where are the people that are going to finally fulfill history coming from? Where are they coming from? They're coming from us somewhere. And if you quit, if you quit, could you imagine if Rahab said, nope, not going to do it. 
what, what, if there, what, what if there wasn't a Leah? Jesus came from Leah's lineage. What if there wasn't a Leah? What if there wasn't a Judah? What if, there, what if none of that happened? What if none of that, where, where's it coming from? The next time that the devil starts to raise up all of your wickedness, you need to remind him that the power of God is the cross of Christ and that he paid for everything so that I can continue to go out here and do this and it is no longer theft. It's not that way. Stop quitting. Stop it. And stand back up. Stand back up. Hold your shoulders up. Not because of what you have done, but because of what he has done. And let's serve God with passion in this world that desperately today needs to see God.